Hello everyone. Suhail Syed here from Cisco. I'm a senior product manager in the cloud. I wanted to um, do a little bit of housekeeping in the beginning. I've left on your table um, some surveys. It's not related to what I'm going to talk about, but it's another session that's happening later today as well as tomorrow around monitoring and logging in the cloud, both as a SaaS as well as an on-premise uh, solution. And it's a project called Zeus that Cisco has developed in-house. Uh, we have a survey where we want to gather some input on what types of logging and monitoring solutions you use, how you use them, what would you like to see in them. So please feel free to provide your input, and I'll collect them at the end of the class. Today, we're going to talk about upcoming services in OpenStack. I wanted to welcome you to Cisco Live. Uh, in the middle of the week, uh, I see a lot of you are wide awake, in spite of it being 2 o'clock, so welcome. Uh, I'm pretty excited. <coughs> There's a lot of good stuff happening at open, in OpenStack, and even though the project has been around for more than four years, evolution continues very rapidly. And today I'm going to talk to you about what's happening in the cloud with respect to OpenStack and all of the different container services. I hope you learn something very useful and take it back to your companies. So today I'm going to talk about the state of the cloud, private cloud, public cloud, where is it going, where are containers, in the public cloud versus private cloud, who's doing what, how they're deploying it. We'll talk about why Cisco, what Cisco doing out here in OpenStack. Um, and we'll talk about these services in OpenStack. And uh, the reason I chose these services is because each of them covers a separate segment. Some of them, Magnum, for example, is container as a service. Kola is about production deployment of OpenStack services inside containers. Courier is about abstracting away networking and providing a common networking interface between containers and VMs, which, you know, as you all may know, it's difficult to do. And then finally, we'll talk about a distributed SDN controller called Dragonflow. So we're going to cover all elements of networking and how containers are deployed and connected. And finally, I'll spend a few minutes talking about how OpenStack is learning from multiple releases and customer feedback over the last few years, and how they're changing the way pr projects are managed and deployed in order to make OpenStack a lot more consumable and a lot more robust. Okay. Private cloud. Adoption of private cloud is growing. It's growing across all providers. And you can see that in small and medium businesses, OpenStack is actually much higher up, right behind VMware, and um, VMware is a vSphere vCenter. This is from the state of the cloud report from RightScale from last year. It was published in December, so we don't have yet have to 2017. But as you can see, clearly there's a good, there's a strong trend from 13% to 19% private cloud adoption continues to grow. If you look inside private cloud adoption, you can see how, the, how they're broken up. What are the types of applications um, versus experimentation versus people who are planning to use, how, how it is divided. And there's a lot more running apps that is growing uh, versus experimenting today. And finally, who's doing the deployments? Bloomberg is an example that's who's deploying OpenStack uh, in 11 clusters across three data centers. Um, and all of you know Bloomberg you know, deals with financial uh, information. So it's interesting. From regular enterprises, I see a lot of banks, a lot of financial institutions who are you know, careful with their data, adopting OpenStack, uh, and going full tilt with it. And in fact, a lot of them are actually looking at even deploying in containers. Um, so things are actually maturing to the point where People are getting more comfortable with deploying their applications in containers as well as in, you know, from just VMs. <coughs> so, speaking of containers, between public cloud and private cloud, as you can see, over the last few years and forecast 2020, this is from IDC's cloud report last year, there's, there is adoption of containers growing. Uh, and it, it was a lot more in the public cloud with Amazon and Azure, but you can see here that even private cloud adoption of containers is growing quite rapidly. So now, <clears throat> just a question. 
Do you see applications running more for enterprises natively inside containers or virtualized inside a VM? What, what do you guys think? In the VM? Anybody else? Container as? OK. So he's right. <laughs> Look at this. This is quite interesting, right? For non-web scale providers, enterprises, Look at this hockey stick. They're all running containers within VMs. Right? This red line is natively. And the reason why they're running containers within VMs, there are many reasons. Legacy applications, uh, multi-tenancy, they want to run, and they want isolation that the VM provides. Right? So the next topics I talk about, starting with Magnum, it's all about container as a service within a VM. And this is where you'll see how people are you know, using it. But this I found quite surprising because my other marketing people were telling me, hey, it's all about cloud native. Yes, but that's a long journey. And right now, a lot of people are adopting containers by running them virtualized within VMs. <coughs> so a quick overview on OpenStack. How many of you guys are familiar with OpenStack? Most of you? Of course, Red Hat. <laughs> So just really briefly, OpenStack is an open source project that gives you various components that allows you to build your own cloud. And there is a compute component, there is a networking component, there is a storage component, and identity component, all of which work together, providing a single standardized API that you can write to, that you can use, and quickly sign up your private cloud. When you look at OpenStack capabilities, these five that I've highlighted here are, are the essential core of OpenStack. These are, the, these are the, what I call dev core. And you have multiple other projects that, are, that come along with it. Silometer is an important one that, that gives you um, uh, a dashboard that you can use. OpenStack traditionally has been running in a six-month cycle. Uh, so twice a year, there are major releases. Starting from next year, or this year, um, from Okata, they are changing things a little bit. So previously, we used to have a major summit. At each summit, there would be design planning for the next release. But going forward, starting with Okata, there is actually going to they're, they're breaking it up. So there is a design, there is a marketing summit, but there is also a working summit that happens much earlier in a shorter interval of time. So in three months earlier, all of the project members get together, and there's a working meeting for a week. The first one is in Atlanta. The point here is they want to make sure that they get enough momentum leading up to the actual summit where they can do better, a better job of marketing it or positioning it rather than you know, doing half of it in the previous summit and then half of it in the next summit. So this is a big change that's, that's happening across the project. And it's being done to continue to accelerate the feature set in OpenStack, but while maintaining quality. So. What really happened on Newton? Newton was the last release that uh, came in November. There were three areas. The top first two are they improved scalability, they improved resiliency. Remember I talked to you about OpenStack is listening, and the community is listening to feedback and realized that it needs to be consumable, it needs to be robust. Well, they made the first big step here in Newton. Uh, in Okata, they're going to continue to focus on stability, they're not releasing that many more features, so this should be good news. But they're focusing on making it more robust. So scalability, resiliency, a lot of focus on security with respect to encryption support for Cinder, and uh, keystone upgrades with encrypted credentials and PCI compliance, and versatility. So you have Ironic. You have multi-tenant networking coming on Ironic with tighter integration with Magnum with the Kubernetes projects, I mean with container projects. Uh, Kola, Kola now supports deploying to bare metal or ironic. Magnum, providing more provisioning for orchestration. And then Courier, bringing networking capabilities. All of these were focus items on Newton. And I see going forward, there's going to be continued focus on these projects over the next two to three more releases. So there's a lot of focus on containers, on deployment, on securing containers on networking containers and managing containers. 
on Newton, the key message was one cloud platform to manage virtual machines, containers, and bare metal. Think about it. If you had a platform where you could go and self-serve and decide which application wants to go, can benefit from bare metal, take advantage of underlying hardware, or you want virtualized, or you want containers, you can get one through OpenStack. That's the focus from Newton, and that's the focus going forward with Okada too. Before I go into Cisco's role, any questions on where OpenStack is going, what are some of the features coming up? None? OK. So why Cisco? Well, Cisco has been involved in OpenStack from the beginning. And we have a large engineering team across Cisco. And I'm part of the OpenStack team in the cloud operations under Lou Tucker. And my team actually does focus on plugins. We focus on community work on Neutron, where we can make the most impact on Nova. On, uh, on even on uh, even on Swift and 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 Barbican, we have a PTL for security on Barbican. We have a board member right now uh, who was previously the code on on Cola. So we have a lot of um, involvement in the community. We feel that we are in a good position to guide the community. At the same time, we feel we have a pulse on the community. So we get very quick feedback on where the community is trying to go, and we can help drive them in the right direction based on what we're hearing from our customers. So that's where we are involved. We also incubate new projects uh, uh, to take advantage of by other projects in the community, like uh, GBP, um, PlaceWise, AWOS. And we also um, help our customers consume OpenStack easily. How? By exposing the devices, the hardware that we are selling, UCS servers, Nexus 9K switches, ASR 1K, we have plugins for all of them that we are exposing through OpenStack. And we also do validated designs. So every design that we build with our customers, reference architectures are fully validated. And we work with Red Hat to do that. And we have two types of offerings where you have a managed offering that Cisco manages for you called MetaCloud. And we have an offering for NFV called Cisco Vim that a customer can, can use to bring up their own NFV private cloud. And on Mitaka, we are not just focused on Neutron. We are focused on a number of other projects. And not only do we just do code uh, contributions, but we also do code reviews. We do documentation. We do bug fixes. So Cisco OpenStack teams actually spread wide. And wherever there is a pain point, we try to help the community address it. And these are some numbers showing where we are. We're not number one, number two. But we believe in focusing on quality and areas that are most important for the community. And of course, our, we have a VP and CTO, Lou Tucker, who is chairman of the board. And he's been chairman of the board for the last few years. Very good, very important position. Like I said before, it helps us understand where the community is going and helps us advise our customers appropriately. So let's go into Magnum. Yeah. I don't know how many of you watched TV, but I wanted to make it a little, uh, little funny, you know, in case people have jet lag, they can smile and wake up. <laughs> so. Since 2015, this project has been active. There are about 100 plus engineers working there with a lot of lines of code being, being generated. So what is, what is Magnum? It's an asynchronous API service on OpenStack that is very compatible with Keystone. There are two main components that, of OpenStack that Magnum interfaces with, Nova and Keystone for identity. It provides multi-tenant container as a service it supports also native clients, and it supports a control plane high availability. So these are some of the other projects that it in integrates with. And it runs on top of micro operating systems from Fedora, RHEL, Atomic, CoreOS, et cetera. This is in a high level. This is in the architecture of Magnum. These are the main portions. There's a controller node, and there is an instance, Nova instance, that, is, uh, that spins up Magnum. 
So the Bay and Bay model is where you actually uh, support plugins from different networking models. So today, for example, it supports Flannel, and it's 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 growing to support other other models too. And on the client side, like I said, you have Docker uh, fundamentally that runs on top of the microOS, spins off Docker containers, and you can orchestrate it from both Swarm or Kubernetes and also now uh, Mesos. So this is a, you use Magnum to spin up your containers as a service within VMs. This is what's being used today on OpenStack to launch containers within VMs. Real world deployment, CERN has been working with Magnum for the last two years and they're really going full tilt here. They fully believe in Magnum as a way of getting containers up and running quickly in a virtualized environment. Um, if you look at the table here, they've actually gone, grown the cluster to 1,000, and they were able to spin it up in 23 minutes. This is amazing. Just scale. I mean, <laughs> two years back, we were thinking about launching one or two containers. These guys have taken it to a completely different level, and they've actually deployed it as a service within the department. So they're running it in production. They made a big splash about this in Barcelona last year. They showed an actual demo of how it looks, how it's working. So pretty amazing to see how a large education, a large scientific organization like CERN is benefiting from an open source project like OpenStack and you know, uh, running it in a production environment. So they have over 2,000 users. And they use it because it's self-service. It's programmable. It's very elastic. You can see that. And it's very efficient for them to spin up containers. Um, so if they have virtual machines, then they can be packed into physical hardware to provide better resource utilization. And they've moved up from 2 million requests to about 7 million requests. And they continue to push the boundaries where they expect to scale. So that's Magnum. So we talked about container as a service. Now we're going to go a little bit more granular and talk about Cola. And Cola, like paint, spreads everywhere. <laughs> Cola has been also alive and active from 2015, but it's got three times the number of engineers and a lot of lines of code. So what is Cola? Cola is designed to operate OpenStack clouds. And its key technical feature is don't mess how deployments are being done. Make it really easy, make it continuous, and easily deployable. It really solves the manageability and availability problem with the current state of our deployment in OpenStack. It also dramatically improves or shortens the spin up time, so deployment time. If you want to upgrade from one version of OpenStack to another, what you should take two days is now from a couple of hours down to seconds. And at Cisco, we've actually used Cola to build the Cisco Vim platform I talked to you about earlier. It uses Colas, uh, similar to Cola, and launches all of the OpenStack services inside containers. What does that do? Well, by launching Nova, Cinder, Swift within containers, now, very quick spin up, right, versus a VM. If they die, you can heal them fast, and you can run them in copies so they're redundant. So that's the real benefit, and, and we are really taking advantage of, the, of that capability in Cola. We have it, in, we have it in, uh, in early field trials with customers. They like what they're seeing, and um, it's pretty good. So we have a co-reviewer from our team who uh, helps guide the project. Uh, Stephen Dick, and as can be expected, we are heavily involved in Cola. So you can see we are among the top two, along with Red Hat, in uh, Cola contributions. And we we track across you know multiple metrics um, how well things are going. So what's the mission of Cola? It's to provide production-ready containers and deployment tools for operating OpenStack. By default, it, offer, it has its own set of defaults, but a user can customize it. It doesn't prevent you from doing that. 
Some of the features include all-in-one mode, uh, multi-node deployment, uh, tools and Docker template to, uh, to, uh, to build Docker images. You can deploy using Ansible. And I'll talk about it very briefly in the next few slides, what it looks like. You can deploy it on top of Kubernetes. Um, you can build containers for CentOS, Oracle, Linux. And you can build both from binary packaging or directly from the source. <clears throat> Over the last few years, <coughs> we have a few other companies who have followed our lead, Oracle being one, Mirantis being another. And they have also adopted Cola as a way of deploying OpenStack services uh, and bringing up the cloud. So from an architecture standpoint, what does it look like if you were to use Ansible to deploy Cola? You build Docker images. First, you push Docker images to a public or an internal registry. And then you use Bifrost. Bifrost is the bare metal service that uh, uh, OpenStack uh, uses to do Pixie initialization. This lets you set up, sets up all of your other servers onto which you're going to launch your containers. And it sets up the SSH keys. You use Cola to initialize all the hosts with the necessary configuration, and then you use Cola to deploy OpenStack. That's the Ansible workflow. Kubernetes, this is the next big area where there's a lot of work happening with Cola, is they are working on releasing a microservice layer first, then a services layer with a compute kit. This is all happening real time, by the way. There's a meta layer where you have the OpenStack services that are implemented by Kubernetes. This is pretty key because Kubernetes comes with a self-healing mechanism. So if one of your services goes down, it will detect it, and it will automatically respin it up in a new container. Um, in our implementation, we do it slightly differently. But when this is ready, we'll probably adopt this way because we want to stay close to the open source uh, community. We have Helm charts that package up all the layers. And then you have Kubernetes operators to manage the state of the microservices and other services. So from an operator standpoint, this is how the Kubernetes structure looks like. You have the compute operator that's managing all of the service operations. And below that, you have all the microservices. So you have microservices on top of your layer, the OpenStack services, and the compute operator acts like meta and manages Keystone secret authentication for each of the services. So Keystone by ships by default with Cola. You have an override config that you can use to override the defaults. Um, the secrets actually store the credentials for the for uh, databases. Uh, and you have actions that you can write up called workflows. So the operator is software that manages the Keystone microservice. And uh, it reads from a third party resource. So now a quick look at what's happening with Cola on Newton. So out here we have charts that show from October 2015 through last year, there's been an increase. I mean, production is still hasn't shown that much of an increase, but there's a lot more people who are interested in, in Cola and a lot more who are beginning to test it. So you can deploy from Pixie bare metal to running OpenStack Cloud on 100 nodes in under an hour. This was demonstrated at Barcelona by Steven from my team, along with Rackspace and a few others. They wanted to show large-scale deployments, how quickly you could do it. So, Pixie bare metal to 100 nodes in an hour with Cola. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing, I would say. Um, they, t they successfully tested 123 node scale on an OSIC cluster under 10 different scenarios. Uh, they did a full deploy, upgrade, and reconfiguring the implementation in about 20 minutes on those 123 nodes. Uh, and they were able to also get a high degree of security via TLS uh, and container drop root and fern it. So they worked for over three months to develop the compute kit that helped them get to this 123 node scale. So progress and roadmap. 
a lot has been done over the last three releases, starting with Mitaka, uh, Newton, and then o o Okata. In, I've just highlighted in, in bold what I think were the most significant um, releases. So in Mitaka in April last year, for example, deployment time was reduced by 80%. Um, they, had, they added MariaDB lights out recovery. In um, last November, they added bare metal deployment using Bifrost, uh, customi customization of Docker files. Then they did 123 plus node scaling. They went actually up to 130 nodes. And they have a white paper, which is published on openstack.org if you're interested. You can go check it out. And for Kata, which is coming out in the next month or so, they, do, they, did, a, they did a repo split between deliverable scholar and Kola Ansible so that you could, there's no dependency between the two, and each of them can continue to evolve fast. Significantly improved gating. Focus on quality. Before you are merging and branching your code, check to make sure that you are meeting the quality requirements and uh, supporting customized policy files. They've also added sanity check playbooks on, on Ansible that you can use to actually check and make sure that you know, you, your services are being brought up in the right manner. Uh, so Cola Ansible will be out with Okata in about March next month, in uh, March 6th. And the Kubernetes uh, tie-in will come end of the month, March 31st. I'm going to pause here. Any questions on Magnum, Container as a Service versus Cola? There's a lot of good stuff happening, guys. And as adoption is growing, you can see that the vehicles are also evolving and helping drive the adoption even more. I'm quite excited to see the community really coming behind containers in a big way and really helping drive that adoption. So now we're going to switch pace a little bit from deployment, from services, underneath the covers a little bit towards networking. OK, so now you, de you deployed your containers within a VM. How do you unify the networking between VM networking and container ne networking? It's complicated. Not to mention, as you bring up these containers within VMs, you now have container networking overlays, like Flannel. So you have Neutron, you have Flannel, then you have the container, then you have the VM. As you can imagine, it's a lot of overhead. So Courier tries to abstract away all of those networking models. It uses Neutron's production-ready uh, model directly and offers a common interface between containers running inside a VM and the VM networking itself. That's the whole point in a nutshell for Courier. So it, it supports nested containers. Um, Container and VM networking on the single API, which is huge if you're an application developer. Um, common code brings con container networking via a single binding strip. So on Mitaka, you had Kubernetes in integration and nested container support. And in Newton, they added advanced services such as security groups and load balancers. Again, addressing another pain point in containers, making them secure, identifying who they are, making them known to other containers, so avoiding noise, avoiding accidental sharing of information. So Courier is actually a bridge between the container framework networking and the storage models to OpenStack networking and storage abstractions. On Kubernetes, from a Kubernetes standpoint, what exactly is the integration? How does it look like? There are two main components of the Kubernetes integration. You have the controller aspect, and you have the CNI aspect of Kubernetes that, uh, that, is, that, that is being uh, implemented here. The controller is a daemon that monitors the API resource and makes sure that the resources are allocated properly to the different tenants, uh, container tenants. And you have a CNI driver, which actually binds the controller to each of the worker nodes on Kubernetes. So the daemon runs usually on the same nodes where you run the Kubernetes API. So as you can see, they are working really hard on ensuring that 
they're taking advantage of all of the benefits that Kubernetes provides and making it available and usable instead of an, an OpenStack cloud. This is an example of a mixed OpenStack environment. This is where Courier really shines, where you can actually have a VM as well as a nested container VM model, all supported by a same common networking model. And they also interface with other networking concepts like OVS, Midonet, Calico, and Dragonflow. So you have different networks at different layers, which is all and it's all done because of the abstraction that Courier is, is providing. Any, uh, any questions? I know it's a lot of information, but it's cool stuff. <laughs> um, take some time, absorb. I don't expect you all to know everything today, but I want to seed, put some seeds in your minds about what's happening on containers, where to go look for things, and understand well how things are being stacked up really nicely. So the next section is Dragonflow. Remember I told you we talked about container as a service, and we talked about deploying containers in production fashion, then how about networking them all together. Now, as you start scaling them out, you need an SDN controller to manage all of the VLAN, VXLAN connectivity and at scale. And here's where Dragonflow comes in. Dragonflow is a distributed SDN controller for Neutron. It's designed to support large-scale deployments, focusing on latency and performance. Because guess what? As you scale out, you're going to start hitting latency and performance problems. So you need to have a way of doing it, without, doing it quickly without being slowed down. It supports containerized advanced services that can run locally on each node. It implements the APIs for Muton using the same core SDN principles. Um, it's lightweight and simple in terms of code size and complexity. That makes it very quick to ramp up and spin up. It targets, it's targeted for high performance environments. At the same time, it's small and simple enough that it can also run in smaller environments. So it can scale up or it can scale down. It's completely pluggable easy to extend and enhance, and more importantly, it has a distributed control plane. So this is just a high-level view of the architecture of, uh, of Dragonflow. So you have the Newton server with all the drivers and the plugins. You have a distributed database, and this is what runs on, the, on each compute node. So you have, a, you have a controller, you have a pluggable database layer that talks with the storage, and it interfaces with, with OBS. So it has a pluggable distributed mechanism, database mechanism to serve the logical data across the data center. And this, because it can plug into different databases, it allows the user, the application developer, for example, to choose his database of choice. So if you're running a, a big data application in a container and you want access to Cassandra or, or uh, MongoDB, you get access through the SDN controller. So we are now at the end of uh, my session. The last piece here I want to talk about is in the beginning, I spoke to you about how OpenStack is listening to the industry, listening to customers from different companies, and trying to make things a lot more predictable, a lot more robust. So what they've done is, from all of the different projects, they've called, got something called TC approved, which means you have to hit a certain level of quality and acceptance, a peer acceptance, before you come under TC approved. And that's a technical kernel, so you have Nova, Keystone, all the way down to, to Trove. But for commercial deployments, in order for you to have an OpenStack logoed commercial deployment, these are the five services that are, that, are, that, are, uh, that are required. If you notice, Neutron is not added to that yet, even though it's a core service. 
and that's because it still continues to evolve, it still continues to get robust, and I'm pretty confident that the next couple of releases, this will end up being part of the main project. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope you guys uh, learned a lot about what's happening with respect to containers on OpenStack, uh, where containers are headed. And all I want you guys is, is to you know, keep using OpenStack, pay attention to what's happening with the community, and keep giving feedback back to the community. Any, uh, any questions on containers? How are people using it? Yes. Pardon? About uh, future services? Oh, um, they're still working on the roadmap. I haven't gotten the latest. Uh, I hope that in Okata they will be sharing some more details. So that's so today. Actually, interestingly, there was a a short-lived uh, Okata announcement. I was hoping that I would they would share more, but they pulled it back. They're going to have another, one more release announcement. Hopefully, that time uh, I'll I'll know by then what are some of the future services. This is what I know for now. Any other questions? So remember, in the beginning, I gave you that survey. I hope you have filled it out. That logging and monitoring service has also been containerized now. Just two weeks back, in Kubernetes, it's been containerized, and it's going to be offered, deployed within a container for on-premise you know, going forward. So here's an example of you know, how we are also taking, you know, doing things organically within a company, you know, taking advantage of what's offered on, in open source. Any other questions? We have a few more minutes. Yes. So the question was: You mo latency problems are mentioned. How do you monitor? So there are open source monitoring tools that are available uh, within Cisco. We have developed our own uh, using Fluent D. That's called Zeus. So it actually acts like a centralized aggregator of all the logs. And you want you to get the logs, you can actually visualize it using Kibana or Grafana. And you, you can see where latencies are coming up from. And in the next couple of versions, it, it, will, it will provide um, better insights into bottlenecks and, and alerts around it. So that's the tool called Zeus, that there's a session that's happening tomorrow afternoon. And uh, there's one actually, um, in the next one hour, there's a lab that's happening with Zeus, where you can go and learn about how do you track latencies and bottlenecks in your cloud. Because your cloud can be quite big, and a lot of nodes, and a lot of services running. Uh, how do you visualize them? So if you, in the next one hour, there's a lab. Tomorrow, there are two sessions going on, where you can go and learn about how you can visualize your logging and services health across the cloud using Zeus. OK? And actually, I have three of my Zeus teammates here. So feel free to reach out to them, and you can learn more about logging and monitoring and visualization and metrics. Anyway, thank you all for coming. I hope you. Uh, Enjoyed the session. I enjoyed it, talking to all of you. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My name is on the session ID. Uh, if you have any questions, you have, uh, you have customers who are interested in using these solutions, looking for advice as you are designing your cloud, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>